What's going on my fellow rock and rollers? Don't forget to hit the bell notification icon to be notified every time I put out a new video on my channel. Back in 1991 and 1992, an up and coming Seattle band named Alice in Chains were at the forefront of an explosion of alternative rock music. Their debut album, 1990's Facelift, had been a slow burn, but started to gain momentum in the spring of 1991 following their hit single, Man in the Box, blowing up. I've done a whole video on the single for Man in the Box, and you guys can check out the video down below in the description box. And Alice in Chains got some pretty high profile touring slots, opening for metal bands Slayer, Anthrax, and Megadeth in 1991 on the Clash of the Titans tour, despite being poorly received in some markets. And one of the other high profile touring slots Alice in Chains got offered was to open for Van Halen. And while the tour had a lot of lighthearted moments and would create long lasting friendships, it also sadly was the beginning of the end for the Seattle band. Stay tuned for the full story. Following the success of Man in the Box's music video on MTV, Van Halen frontman Sammy Hagar wanted to have the band open for them from August of 91 to January of 92 with some breaks sprinkled in between. Hagar would tell the Seattle Post, I said let's find a cool new band that needs exposure. I was watching MTV and saw Man in the Box's video. Lane Staley is one of the greatest new singers today. At the same time however, Hagar would admit that bands like Alice in Chains also made him insecure as he would reveal to Sirius XM here. Do you ever do that? Do you ever look back and like kind of in hindsight and go like, God, uh, I, I am a little bit freaked out by the new guy or I'm a little bit nervous about it. Are you at a comfortable place? Oh, I'm at a total comfortable place now. But when you're like in Van Halen in the 90s, when grunge came along, you know, right. that was freaky, man, because I'm looking at these guys and, you know, we're, we were sort of the glam rock, you know, we're all dressed up and looking like, dressing like girls and stuff, you know. <laughs> I mean, come on, I'm, <laughs> you, you look know, pretty Motley fucking Crue fabulous. And, yeah. and Poison and these guys. More hairspray It was me. more fun dressing like that than the way I dress now, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, then when grunge came and they were like, you know, down and dirty and right. funky. Right, Nirvana or, comes along. Yeah, and, and they made me nervous. You know, I thought these guys, are, they're going to disrespect us. You know, you know, they're going to, you know, look at you say, yeah, you know, your shit's done, buddy. But, and it didn't happen. I I, I was so insecure about it that I invited uh, Alice in Chains with their first album, their first single, when they had Man in the Box, to open for Van Halen. They came out on the whole tour with us, and I, I've been dear friends with Jerry Cantrell since then, but that's how insecure I was. I said, no, let's get them on the damn show. That way their fans will know that we're cool and, and we're giving them a... Holy shit. Yeah. That's kind of genius, though, but it came out of a fear. Yeah, it came out of fear a little bit. Not bad fear, but like no. nervousness. It I came out it. of a nervous... But then also a kind of an intelligent one, because I bet it worked. It did. No, they did really good, and, and you know, business was good, and, we be and I made a friend out of it, you know. Still friends so, with them. Oh, yeah. Jerry and I, he comes to Cabo from a birthday bash every friggin' year. Oh, I can only imagine... The it was a dream come true for the members of Alice in Chains, as according to the book Alice in Chains, The Untold Story by David DeSola, singer Lane Staley saw Van Halen between the ages of 10 and 12, and according to his stepfather Jim Elmer, that was when Lane really took an interest in music. I'm ready to go on, on stage uh, opening for his band, and he's standing in my pit with Valerie right next to him and Wolfie in her arms, and he's got his guitar on, and he's like just running scales, and he's like, Hey dude, what's up? And I'm like, fuck, are you fucking kidding me? Eddie Van Halen's standing there with his with Valerie Bertinelli and Wolfie, and he's in my pit, and I'm opening for his band. And uh, I was so fucking nervous. So I came over and said hi to him, and he's like, oh man, you're gonna be fine. And I think it was probably the worst show I ever played in my life because I could not stop thinking he's right there, you know. So I just couldn't focus, and I just I couldn't wait till the gig was over. And then after that, I was fine, but. But that, that first gig was that first gig was nerve wracking because I just I just could not get out of my head that Eddie Van Halen is looking at me and we're playing in front of Van Halen and you know, but uh, we ended up being really good friends. Bassist Mike Starr was also a huge Van Halen fan, writing in his high school yearbook that one of his dreams was to open for Van Halen. And while the tour with Van Halen was a dream come true, it would also introduce the greatest villain in Alice in Chains' tragic story as a band, and that was the drug heroin. According to David DeSolo's book and several of Lane's friends, it was believed that the Van Halen tour is where the singer was first introduced to the drug. Alice in Chains producer David Jordan, who worked on the band's first and second records, Facelift and Dirt, recalled seeing Alice in Chains on the Van Halen tour, revealing to DeSolo, 
I went to Arizona and saw them play with Van Halen, and Lane was definitely acting different at that point. Lane was usually gregarious and cracking jokes all the time, and I went to their tour bus and saw the band before the concert, and Lane was really quiet. I didn't know what was up with him. Jordan would ask Lane how does it feel to be famous, to which the singer replied, it's freaking me out. People treat me like an object. I'm not a person anymore. I'm just a commodity to be sold. People don't really know who I am. People grab things from me, he'd say. It was also during the same tour that bassist Mike Starr was found by Van Halen's security to be scalping tickets to shows to make some extra money to get drugs. It's possible this also led to his dismissal from the band in early 1993. Now, not everything that happened during the Van Halen tour was bad as both bands became close. Eddie Van Halen spent a lot of time hanging out on Alice in Chains' tour bus, with guitarist Jerry Cantrell claiming the guitarist hung out more with them than he did with his own band. Cantrell and Van Halen would remain good friends up until the guitarist's death a couple weeks ago. Even following the tour, the members of Van Halen were pretty gracious with Alice in Chains. At one point during the tour, Jerry offered to buy one of Eddie's guitars, but he declined. And following the tour, Cantrell found himself living in the basement of his manager Kelly Curtis, when one day he discovered that Eddie Van Halen had sent him a garage full of amplifiers and guitars. And Van Halen bassist Michael Anthony would also send Mike Starr several bass guitars and amps as well. The tour with Van Halen was also notable because it was a scene of an ongoing prank war between both bands. Cantrell would reveal how Van Halen pranked Alice in Chains four times in one night, revealing to interviewer Jim Dunlop. A lot of pranks get pulled on stage, it's kind of a tradition to F with each other at the end of the tour, especially the opening bands. I remember the Van Halen guys got us like four times in one set. When we came out on stage, they had taken a bunch of three foot strips of duct tape and put them all over the stage face up. So when we walked out and within a couple seconds we were all dragging around these huge wads of duct tape on stage. They sent out some strippers, not very attractive ones, who stayed out there for the whole song. Then they sent one of their techs, I think he was a guy named Zeke, in a little Bo Peep outfit with some live sheep. And at the very end of our set we were playing Man in the Box and their crew came out and started dismantling our entire set around us. They left Sean with a kick and a snare, left me with one cab and they just unplugged Mike Starr. And that was all in one set. I don't think anyone has ever topped that commitment to effing with the opening act, he'd say. But Alice didn't take it lying down as the band got back at Van Halen with the guitarist revealing in the same interview. On the flip side of that, there's a photo, which you guys can see here, which I think some people have seen but I don't think is necessarily public knowledge. So Van Halen used to do their signature walk across the stage and at the time they had these skimpy panties that they would sell to chicks in the audience. Really skimpy ones. So we took some of them and put them on and of course they weren't big enough to keep our junk in so we had to turn them around and put the butt parts in the front to keep our stuff together and put on some combat boots and we made ourselves up as strippers and did the Van Halen signature walk across the stage behind them. And they didn't know what was happening except for Alex. There's a great photo of it taken right as Eddie turns around and realizes what's going on and he's totally losing it. He's one of the guys who never Fs up. I've seen him play in so many different states and he's always on, but hearing him miss a couple notes while getting a laugh, one of us was great. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. And as always, if you have suggestions for future topics, let me know in the comment section below. Take care.